I will, there is no way in the world that I'm going to finish tonight uh, because last Wednesday night we did the rapture of the church and I got us off the ground. Amen. We ascended. We met the Lord in the air. But tonight I'm going from that point to the second coming, the millennial reign, and what happens with the new heaven and the new earth. Can you all understand me trying to do that in one night? No. I agree. Uh, so let me pray, take off, and we will go. I'm going to really do this almost in outline form. And anything that we need to know more about, I'll be more than happy to go back and talk more in depth about those things. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray that uh, I want to be selfish and begin to pray for myself at the beginning of this prayer. Lord, you're in heaven and you're watching me. And I say like I always say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I want to come clean. Holy Spirit, wipe me away. I know that I am forgiven. But Lord, I want to acknowledge those sins before you. And I don't want to take those things for granted. So I will always want to be quick to confess my sins. Because when I do, uh, it, though those sins are forgiven, it puts me in right relationship with you. I don't want to hold on to anything. So Father, I pray that you empty me of myself so that I can be filled with the Holy Spirit. I do pray for an anointing from above so that the words of my mouth will be your words. The meditations of my heart would be that would bring you honor and glory and praise. Father, there are thousands of books, thousands, more than I could even comprehend or number or, or know that are written about this subject. And I know that nothing that I say tonight is going to add to that. But I do pray for clarity. I, I do pray that we will have ears to hear you, that your word will be alive, that you will quicken in our spirit, that, Lord, it will begin to make sense, that we can connect the dots, so to speak, so that we can understand. So, uh, Lord, may this time together bring you honor and glory. Bless everyone that is listening, even if they're in this room or if they're watching online. In your name I pray. Amen. Let me give you a brief outline of the book of Revelation. And I want to say from the very beginning that most of the time when I'm talking to people about the book, they call it the book of Revelations. Have you all said that? It's the book of Revelations. That's incorrect. There's no S on the end. It's the Revelation. A revelation of God. It's not like that there's going to be 20 more Revelations. What God said... He said, he doesn't need to add to it. By the way, if you're looking for something else, you're not going to get it. And it's all there. Now, as a young Bible student, I was absolutely enthralled because I wanted to know what I didn't know. There was probably more books in my library, which was a small library, but there was more books in there about prophecy than all the, all the rest because I wanted to be consumed by it. And I have preached through the book of Revelations at least three times in my ministry. I've preached on parts of them at other times. Um, and, and people, one, one time they said, Pastor, why don't you write a book about this? And I'm like, hold on. There are thousands of books. There doesn't need to be another book. And they said, no, no, no. I'm not saying you're going to add anything, but so that you can be able to keep up with what you know. And the problem with that is, is that mine continuously changes. There's a, a great scholar by the name of John Phillips who wrote a book, I think it's one of the better books, on the book of the Revelation. And John Phillips said after he wrote the book, I mean, nobody, no ghostwriters, he put down every word. He said he didn't even agree with the book that he just wrote. Took him two years to write it, and he didn't even agree with his own book his own, he, he wrote. He'd have to continue to revise it. That's what the book of Revelation does to us. So let me just kind of give it to you in broad form, and hopefully you can keep up with it together. If I start going too fast, just wave. I know you're either getting the glory bumps or I'm going too fast, all right? If you're doing this, that means I'm going too fast. In chapter 1, Jesus appears to John on the, on the Isle of Patmos and says, Write the things which you see. In chapters 2 and 3, the things which are, which is the church age. He wrote to seven literal churches that talk about those literal churches, but it also talks about types of Christian, and it talks also about how Christians will be in the, in the broad expanses of time. And then when we get to chapter 4, the things which will come, and that is future tense. 
So when you get to chapters 4 and chapters 5, you see a picture in heaven. Now, in the book of Revelation, you're going to see it kind of go back and forth. It's like playing tennis. It's like they're going to kick it to heaven, and you'll see what's going on in heaven. Then they'll kick it back to earth, and you'll get a picture of what's going on on earth. And then you get to like chapters 12 and 13, and it's kind of like a parenthesis, and they'll go from Genesis to Revelation. They'll kind of talk about the whole gamut of how everything is together. So you've all, because we live in time, we're, we're always caught up and we want everything to be chronological because it's easy for us. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to get more than that. There's nothing that's going to, if you put the pieces together, they are wonderfully put together. A is there, B will follow A, C will follow B. But you're not going to find any place here where you're going to just see it all together. It's going to do a picture of it. So in chapters 4 and 5, we get a picture of the throne in heaven after the rapture. In chapter 6 through chapter 18, you get a period of what is called on the earth the Great Tribulation, or the Tribulation, excuse me, the last, last half of the Tribulation, we call it the Great Tribulation. Then when we get to chapter 19, the second coming of God, chapters 20, the millennial reign, and, and how those things will be, and then we get to chapters 21 and chapters 22, the new heaven and the new earth. Sometimes there will be people that will piece them, they'll get a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and they'll put them together and say, no, 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 they're different things. For instance, in the Old Testament, there is much that is talked about the millennial reign. So when they were looking for the Christ, the Messiah, the king that was to come, the, the rod of Jesse, <clears throat> they were looking for that one that in the Old Testament was described as Jesus, who will be there during the millennial reign. So when Jesus came on the earth, that's what they were looking for with the Messiah. And yet Jesus came humble. Jesus came as the suffering servant. He came to give his life on the cross of Calvary. He came to be our Savior and our Redeemer. They were looking for him to come as the one who would kick the government out and rule with a rod of iron. And really, they were, if, if Jesus had done that, they would have gone with him just like Judas was looking for that one to come. And by the way, let's not just throw Judas under the bus. You know, James and John, the sons of thunder, they said, uh, you remember when the, they sent their mom to talk to Jesus and said, when you come back in your kingdom, can one of my sons sit on the right hand, the other son sit on the left hand? They were looking for that millennial reign where Jesus would rule the, the earth. Now that's coming. So they, they, they were getting their time frame mixed up. So tonight, we're going to look at what happens after the rapture. And, um, and I got notes. I got to keep to this because if I don't, I'm going to be so scattered. Y'all all right with that? All right. So let's, for us to do this right, we're going to have to go back in the Old Testament. So take your Bible, we're going to read a lot of scripture tonight, to the book of Daniel. How many of you know that you cannot understand the book of Revelation unless you understand the book of Daniel? I got no amens on that. As a matter of fact, it's backwards too. You'll never understand the book of Daniel without fully understanding the book of Revelation. They, they both tell you. There are mysteries when you, could you imagine trying to read Daniel without fully understanding the things? We have the, the uh, ability now to look back at it in hindsight. So like in Daniel chapter 2, turn to chapter 9. But in Daniel chapter 2, the vision that Nebuchadnezzar had that Daniel revealed to him spoke about the, the kingdoms, the, 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 wor the world rule, that the, there would be a kingdom that would rule the whole world. The first one was Babylon. The second one was the Medo-Persian Empire. They would overthrow Babylon. The third was the Greek Empire that would overthrow the, the Persian Empire. The fourth was the Roman Empire. And we know the Roman Empire imploded, but the, the, the kingdom that is yet to come will be the, the revitalized Roman Empire with the Antichrist as the one who is leading them. So that's what we see, the ten toes of that beast in, in Daniel chapter 2. But when we get to uh, Daniel chapter number 9, look in verse number 20. You there say amen. amen. Now while I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin and the sins of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the mount, 
holy mountain of my God, that is the holy people, the, group, the whole group of people together. By the way, verse 20 is a wonderful thing. Every Christian, if you don't know what you need to be doing, go look at verse 20, and that's a wonderful thing. That wasn't just something Daniel did. Oh, what it would be if every Christian today could follow that example, praying, confessing sin, uh, their personal sins, the sins of its people, Supplic uh, praying supplication for our families, our church, our world. That's a wonderful outline of things we should do. But while he was doing that, he says, yes, while I was speaking in, in prayer, the man Gabriel, y'all know the angel Gabriel, archangel, the seraphim? whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. Understanding of Scripture must come from the Holy Spirit of God. person who does not have the illumination of the light of God interpreting this book can make a mess of things. And they can, they can come up with this theory and that theory, but unless we know God and hear the voice of God, how will we know what this is all about? Well, he says, at the beginning of your, supplication and uh, of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to you, for you are greatly beloved, therefore consider the matter and understand the vision. Now, here we're going to see a vision of 70 weeks. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But I want you to see something here. Look in chapter 12. I wasn't going to read verses 1, 2, 3, but, but I want to get a run and start at this. At that time, Michael shall stand up. Michael is the guardian angel. He is the angel assigned to Israel. The Jewish people. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble. This is the tribulation. Such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. Notice that book is singular. Not books. We'll talk about that later. But everyone written in the book. That's the Lamb's book of life. What is, the, what is the, Lamb, the most important book in heaven? What is the Lamb's book of life? It is where every person who is a believer in God, in Jesus, their name is written in the Lamb's book of life. So he says here that at that time your people, that's the Jewish people, shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. We'll talk about that in a minute, but understand everyone who has a soul will be resurrected. Verse 3, those who are wise shall shine like, the bright, shine like the brightness of the firmament. Those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Verse 4, but you, Daniel, shut up the words. Seal the book until the times of the end. So Daniel gets to this point, and he's writing these things down. And Michael says, this is for the end times. But, but what I want you to do is take the book, this book that you're writing, and seal it. <clears throat> seal it. Shut it up. Now, understand, take a piece of parchment paper that they would write on it front and back, and they would roll it up, take wax, and seal it. And they would take a second piece of paper and roll it up on top of it and take the wax and seal it. Put the ring on it and seal it. And take the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth and the seventh. So this book that is being sealed, okay, until the end is seven seals all sealed put together. The point of it is it is not for this time. It was given beforehand. But it's not for this time. There will be a time. Now what the Old Testament saints did not realize, that when Jesus came, he would come as the suffering servant, the Savior, who would die on the cross of Calvary, who would be buried, but resurrected and ascended. What they did not understand was Pentecost forward, what we call the day of grace, 
the day of Gentiles, the church age. But when the rapture comes, that's coming to an end. And the tribulation will begin. So look what it says in verse 5. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there stood two, one on the riverbank and the other on the, the riverbank. And one, excuse me, one on this riverbank and the other on that riverbank. And the one to the, and one said to the man, I got to slow down, clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, how long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? They're wondering, how long? I've got to seal it. How long? Everybody always wants to know how long. Verse 7, then I heard the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven, and swore by him, that is God, who lives forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and half a time. Let me just talk about this for just a second. Time is one. Times, more than one, that's two. Half a time, that's half of one. So if you add them together, time, that's one. Times two, now if you add them all together, that's three. Half a time, three and a half. The last half of the tribulation, the tribulation will be seven years. The last half of it, three and a half years. They counted days as 360 days. So this is 1,280 days. I got everybody confused yet? That's verse 7. All right. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. Although I heard, I did not understand. Anybody say amen to that? Then I said, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? He's still wanting to know the time frame of it. And he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the times of the end. Many shall be purified, made white, refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Verse 11 is very important. From the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there should be 1,290 days. Now, hold on. That's 30 extra days. All right? Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. That's 45 additional days. Now, from the time of the abomination of desolation, 1,280 days. But then there will be an event that will happen after that 30 more days, after that, 45 more days. And if you've got that question of what those numbers are, I'll tell you later. I don't have time to go into that all that tonight. But you, he says in verse 13, go your way to the end. You shall rest and will arise to your inheritance at the end of the days. Now, let me, let me go real quickly here. Here is the picture that we see of the tribulation. The, well, gosh. I gotta, I, I gotta do Revelations four. Let me, everybody, turn over to Revelation four. I want to talk to you really quick about the rapture and the second coming, so that you'll see this. Are you in Revelation four? Say Amen. Look in verse one. After these things, I looked. And behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was a, like a trumpet speaking with me and saying, come up here and I will show you these things which must take place after this. Now here's a, a personal description of, of that where John is, is, he's there on the Isle of Patmos, but he's taken up and he will see the things that are unveiling in future. He's still in time living on the earth but he's taken to that which is not guarded by time to a place in the future. Scholars look at this, chapter 4, verse 1, as the door opened in heaven as the rapture of the church. Now, before you swallow hard, let's turn to chapter 19. Verse number 11. Revelation 19, verse number 11, you're going to see this is the second coming of Christ. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white throne, and he who sat uh, on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges 
and make swore. Once again, look in verse 11. Now I saw heaven open. Two times you see in the book of Revelation. One is at the beginning before all the tribulation begins. One is at the end of the tribulation, the end of that seven years, when he will come back. There will be a battle, we'll talk about it here in a little moment, called Armageddon. And Jesus will begin his reign on the earth for a thousand years. So let's summarize. All right. In the Old Testament, there are 70 weeks. There are 70 weeks. Seven weeks, 40, and each one of those weeks is consisted of seven. So seven of seven years. Seven weeks of seven years, 49 years. He says, from the time that they announced the beginning of the rebuilding of the temple. Hezekiah, you understand those things? Of, that, of when they said, Darius said, you can go rebuild the temple. It took them 49 years. From that time, 62 weeks. Uh, that's 400, I believe, in 38 years. And that is 62 groups of seven. If you look at from the time that the temple was to be rebuilt until it was completed, until the time at the end of that 438 years, that's when the Christ would give his, well, when he would give his life. And you can date that. You can literally look at the dates on it from the times that that happened until the time that Jesus gave his life on the cross of Calvary. I don't know if that excites you, but if you like numbers, that's cool. Now, that's only 69 weeks. In Daniel chapter number 9, he says, but the 70th week, that group of seven, that's the tribulation years. That's why it's separated. That's why it's not yet. So the rapture occurs, chapter 4, verse 1. The doors open in heaven. Then in chapters 19, the doors open in heaven again, and Jesus comes back to begin his millennial reign. In between is that seven-year period. Now let's talk about the seven-year period. Am I, am I, I'll, I'll actually take a time out. Is everybody cool? Everybody got it? All right. I know it's not because you have problems listening. It's because I have trouble speaking. So let's talk about these seven years. It consists of um, seven seals, the book being opened. Take your Bible, look in Revelation 5. The book that Daniel was sealed in Revelation 12. I mean, excuse me, Daniel 12. Yeah, I told you I misspeak. When that book was sealed, I believe that's the same book that you see in Revelation 5. Read with me in verse 1. Revelation 5, verse 1. I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? No one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and to look at it. This is John talking. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. That book that speaks about the end time that Daniel was told to seal, no one could open it. It was sealed. Verse 5, But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Who's he talking about? Come on, you can say it loud. Say it loud enough they can hear you online. That's right, Jesus Christ. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. I love the picture of this. He's still presented to us as a lamb. He's still the redeeming, redeeming one. The one who was slain for us. Now, as though it had been slain, that means he's alive and well having seven uh, horns, that is all, the seven's the number of completion, all power. Horns 
or the symbol of power. And seven eyes, that is all understanding or all wisdom. He is omnipotent, all powerful. He is omniscient. He knows all. This is Christ, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand, right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken, I'm going to go ahead and read, read on because I like this. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, having, each having a heart that is a symbol of worship. Golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Every prayer that has been prayed by the redeemed has been kept. Every prayer of God's people looking for God to come through for us, to be there for us, is kept. Who is worthy to be that, that, that lamb? Who is worthy to be the redeemer? They're worshiping, verse 9 said, they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. The angels actually sing too. They sing, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And, and the four elders and the 24 um, living creatures, they, say, they come singing blessings and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. So Jesus comes, he takes the scroll, and he begins to open them. He breaks the seal, and those seven seals are opened. Now during this time of the tribulation, the first half of the tribulation is a time of setting up for what's going to come in the last half of the tribulation. Now, that's where we're going to see these seven seals. Now the seventh seal is the blowing of the seven trumpets. And the blowing of the seventh trumpet is the seven bowls of wrath that are poured out upon the earth. So the speed of these things starts speeding up. And that last three and a half years is just unbelievably bad. The Bible says worse than anything that this earth has ever faced at all. By the way, we're wimps when we talk about all the troubles of COVID, when it has nothing that can compare to what the people will, on the earth will go through during that time of great tribulation, all right? So let me, I'm watching the clock. Um, let me talk to you about why the tribulation, why this seven-year period. I think it's clear from Scripture that Israel has always been God's chosen people. And they turned their back on the Christ. They crucified the Christ. Matthew 5, verse 17. Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill. I believe the tribulation was to give Israel one last chance to repent. He's about to blow the whistle at the end of the tribulation. He's about to say, you better make up your mind now. I, I'm, I'm going I'm to allow some absolutely devastating things to happen. And, and you're going to fall for it. But yet I'm going to be graceful enough. I'm going to warn you. And those of you who have wisdom, you're going to hear and you're going to read and you're going to say, we better listen. We better listen. But just understand, our loving God before he blows the whistle and calls an end to it, is going to give Israel one last chance to be redeemed. And many will. Now, in the first part of that seven years, that last week, Satan, the Antichrist, will be unveiled. This is the um, false trinity. You know, there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Amen? The true tr trinity is God the Father, right? The unholy trinity, the false trinity, is Satan. There is the Antichrist, who is Satan's opposite of Christ, Jesus. 
There is the Holy Spirit, which is the opposite by the false prophet. And the false prophet is the one who will come and deceive, the one who will come and do miracles and will point people to the Antichrist. And they'll see all the powers of the things that are happening and they will put their allegiance behind the Antichrist. So in the first three and a half years, you will see this thing rise to power. I believe in end times. And I don't know, and you don't know, when that will be. Matthew 24, Jesus told us that he's not concerned about that, only the Father knows. But he also told us all these things so that we would know. The season, look at the fig tree, right? You know those things, be warned. I think we're close to the end. I think that if you looked at the earth today as a chessboard, all the pieces are in place. All we really need to have happen <clears throat> is for the trumpet to blow, the rapture of the church to come, and the tribulation to begin on the earth. Now, if, if that happens tonight, that would tell you that the Antichrist is already alive. I will tell you that when the rapture of the church happens, the Antichrist will be alive on the earth and will have an influence because once the Holy Spirit who lives within the believer, right? You ask Jesus to come into your heart and he comes into your heart through the power of the Holy Spirit. If the believers are taken out of the earth, now, the Holy Spirit, though he is everywhere, he lives within us and he will not be here. And, and it's almost like Jesus takes his hand off and allows Satan to do what he wants for a season because what he wants is for Israel to repent and get saved. Just think about this. If we are living in last times now, Satan could be alive and well. I've got, I'm only about a third of the way through, but I've got one more thing you need to hear me with tonight. Take your Bible, turn to 2 Thessalonians. You know, I, I, I really got to the point where I, I don't preach a lot on prophecy. I really don't. Um, you haven't heard me do it since I've been here. A lot of people just wound up about prophecy. They just wound up about it. A lot of people are also wound up about heaven. And I'm grateful to know about heaven. And I'm grateful to know about prophecy. But I, I find that there are a lot of people that that's all they care about, that's all they're thinking about, is that when I'm, I'm trying to deal with what am I doing today, if that makes sense, being faithful in my today. But I will tell you, and um, my head has been spinning because I have read so much scripture this week. Um, if you think I'm throwing it out to you, I'm, I'm not, I've barely thrown out some of the stuff that I've read to be reminded of. It does excite me because it reinvigorates me that this is a lot, this is real, and God's got this. And the thing that I see today is a lot of people who are very fearful, and we really shouldn't be fearful. The, the last chapter of the book has been written, and we know how it's going to turn out. So in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he, he talks about um, when this thing is about to occur. Verse 1. Y'all there with me? Say amen. amen. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us as though the day of the Lord had come. They had been told that the, the, day of God, the day of Christ was done. It was over with, that there was nothing coming in the future. He said, let no, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. I want you to look at that word there, falling away. 
That's what the New King James says. It's uh, the Greek word apostasia. Not apostasy. Apostasia. And it means uh, to uh, a rebellion or, get this now, that's what a lot of people, when they read this, they say, well, in the last days they will depart. And the love of many will grow cold. That's true. Matthew 24, he says the love of many will grow cold. But this word, it means not only, um, um, it also means a departure, a rebellion, or a departure. A departure. Now look at this. Let no one deceive you by any means, that for that day will not come unless the departure comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Most people believe he's talking about the, the, the Holy Spirit being taken, out, taken away that will come with the rapture of the church. And here he, when he's talking about this Antichrist, Satan's Christ, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That is what is going to be called the abomination of desolation that Daniel talks about and Revelation talks about. Verse 5. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining. What is keeping these things back from happening? Who is it that's keeping these things back from happening? Now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Who is restraining? The Holy Spirit. Satan cannot do whatever he wants. Remember with Job? God gave limitations on Satan. You can do this, but there's a point that you can't go past. Until this point, there is the one called the prince of the power of the air. That's Satan. Amen? Temporarily, he's doing some ugly stuff. There's some terrible things that's happening in this earth. But that's going to come to an end. But he says, don't, none of this is going to happen until the one who is restraining is taken out of the way. Then, verse 8, the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. When he does come back in Revelation 19, the second coming, he will do away with him. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. For this reason, God will send them strong delusion, that they should not believe the lie. There will be many people who will be saved during the tribulation. But there will be many people who are following Satan that God's going to say, you're not going to get this opportunity. There will be no wooing in your heart. And you're going to live with the decision you've already made. He calls those, those who will receive the strong delusion. That they might be condemned who did not believe the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. This is a scary point. If the rapture of the church happens, that means that there will be people who have said no to God, and God's going to say to, that, to some of that group, I'm not going to give you another chance. But to some, he will give the wooing. And they will see and believe and know. As ugly as Satan is, he's going to come in and be set up as really the ruler of the world, the fourth Roman Empire. He will rule politically out of Europe, but the whole world will follow him. He will rule economically, and you cannot buy and sell without taking his mark. And religiously, the divide between the first three and a half years and the last three and a half years is the abomination of desolation. How will that happen? This is my last point. Satan sets himself up as he, he has his antichrist. The world falls in behind him. Everybody's believing him. He promises Israel. He signs a peace treaty with them and says, I will rebuild the temple. That's in Jerusalem. 
That's Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Christians are gone. They're raptured out of this place. Jews, they like it. You're going to rebuild our temple. We can put the sacrifices back in. What would happen if some ruler said, we're going to take down the, the, the Dome of the Rock, which is where the temple would be. We're going to take down all the Islamic stuff, and, and it's gone, and, and he's going to sign with Israel this peace treaty to rebuild the temple. Ezekiel 38 and 39 says there's an army from the north. And it talks about all the, the, the countries around that you and I would look at today and say Islamic countries. And they're going to come against Israel. And the Antichrist will fight for Israel and defeat the army of the north. Then no one else will dare fight against the Antichrist. And halfway through, he will stop the daily sacrifice in the temple and he will set himself up as God. It is described in Daniel and in Revelation as the abomination of desolation. Satan there defaming the temple. He's going to take great glee in that. All God's going to do is just pour out so very much. Next time we get together, we'll talk about the Olivet Discourse and we'll start flying through the tribulations and we'll get there. My time has come. My time is gone. I pray this is not as clear as mud. I pray that it's more clear than that. I will tell you that this is much, but it's not really as complicated as people try to make it out to be. Um, there, are, there are people who will strain in a gnat. That's why there are thousands of books on the book of Revelation. And I have so many people who want to come and they say, well, Pastor, what do you think about this? Pastor, what do you want to think about that? And they want to argue with me. And I, I'll be honest with you, I don't argue with anybody anymore. If they want to tell me that this is what this means, I'll say, amen. I don't agree, but amen, you know. Because you, who, am I, who am I to say? I'm trying to interpret this. And I know other well-minded, good-minded people who are trying to look at it. And they'll say, well, I believe the, the rapture happens in the middle of the tribulation, or I believe the rapture happens at the end of the tribulation. Well, I'm going to tell you what I believe, and I'll tell you why I believe what I believe. But uh, that, I just want you to know, when we get to the end of the next time, and we look at it again, it'll make more sense. We're halfway through the surgery. I mean, we're all, we're all cut up, and we've got guts all over, over the place, and it, it looks kind of messy right now. But we'll, we'll, get, we'll get the... We'll get it all put back together, and hopefully it'll make more sense. Last word I have to say for you this. If there's anything this should teach us, is that there is a place that will be built for the devil and his angels. At the end of the tribulation, the Antichrist and the false prophet will be sent there. Satan will be put into the bottomless pit for a thousand years, but they'll be sitting in that lake of fire. I think it should tell us that people who die that do not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and Lord will be separated from God in a place that he called a lake of fire. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. That should, we should be rejoicing that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. But we should also understand the seriousness of what will happen to those, many of them friends of ours, who do not know Jesus Christ, their personal Savior and Lord. Lance, if you'll go back up and turn that thing off, I'm going to pray a prayer. I appreciate it. Father, I love you. Oh, Lord, I feel like I've rushed. I hope I've communicated. I've read a lot of scripture. Our minds are so easily distracted. But you told us in the book of Revelation that there is a blessing that you promised to every one of us that read it. No other book promises that. I know that. I'm agreeing with you. And I'm praying that fulfillment of that prophecy in our lives. 
that we will be blessed with a new energy and excitement. And yes, Lord, uh, an understanding that we need to be redeeming the time because the days are evil. We only have a certain amount of time. So let us be the church. Let us rejoice. But Lord, let us be on mission. May the last words that you said to us before you ascended be the first words that we take to live out today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.